stocks, bonds, ETFs, straight out of downtown Chicago. This is Zach's Market Edge. Welcome to Zach's Market Edge, the podcast about investing in your life. I'm your host, Tracy Reinick, and this week I'm joined by Zach's equity strategist, Jeremy Mullen, who is also the editor of Zach's Counter-Strike newsletter, and he's taking up the helm of our new Commodity Innovators newsletter, which is launching right now here in mid-February, if you're listening to this. If you're listening to it sometime in the spring or the summer of 2020, it's already launched, but right now... You can do a trial of this newsletter. I I know I keep bringing this up on all of our episodes here, but we do have a 30-day trial for just a dollar where you can try out this new Commodity Innovators and all of our other newsletters. Jeremy's other newsletter, my two newsletters, which are Insider Trader and Value Investor. So you can go in and check them out, get all of our picks, and then quit out of the trial (laughs) if you so desire. Um, But yeah, I encourage people to go check these out. And I wanted to have Jeremy on today. He hasn't been on with us for a couple of years because I haven't really covered commodities much on the Market Edge podcast. They've kind of been out of favor. I did one podcast on gold recently with Kevin Cook, one of the strategists here, and he basically said never buy gold. (laughs) And so you can go listen to that podcast too if you're, um, you know, kind of anti-gold or you just want to hear what our arguments are about why investors shouldn't be buying it. But I know a lot of people like the commodities. I used to own some gold and some silver, various ETFs. I owned some of the miners over the years. I did sell those numerous years ago, Jeremy, because I was like, man, these are going nowhere. Um, I haven't really been inclined to get back in, but I know you're going to be covering gold in this newsletter because it seems like something's happening with it again, and we could see maybe a breakout here. I keep seeing all these gold bugs on my Twitter feed going like, this is the year. We're going to 2000 and beyond. And now we have coronavirus and some other things causing some jitters out there, which usually makes people want to go into gold. So what are you thinking launching this newsletter right in the middle of coronavirus. Um, You know, we've had like the worst sell-off in copper in like 40 or 50 years, seemingly. We have like crude on the decline, like, you know, gold could be in play. How how do investors even start with commodities? Right. Well, thank you for having me back, first of all. I'm really, really excited to talk about all this and really excited about this newsletter particularly because um, people just don't know a lot about commodities. So one of the things, not only making picks is fun and making some money is fun, but I really want to get into just educating people on the different segments. And for me, I like to nerd out on this stuff. It's okay. just it's <laughs> just, it's just a fun, fun category, whether it be eggs or metals or energy. It's just something you don't normally hear or talk about, uh, especially in financial media. Sure, you'll see mentions and you'll see little blurbs, but it's just an area that is you know, people aren't educated on a lot. So that's going to be fun is just uh, talking about that and creating content about uh, commodities. And, uh, yeah, going back to your question, though, with gold um, and uh, and coronavirus and all that tied together, uh, the it's kind, coronavirus is kind of a wrench thrown into our plans. Because right. when I dreamt this up, this uh, this newsletter up and, and had this idea, the whole idea was China coming back online. Okay. Phase one trade deal is done. Global growth coming back, pent yeah. up demand coming back. Let's get it. Let's get in commodities. Let's go. Well, <laughs> you saw some price appreciation in some of these commodities in that idea, right? Yeah. And the yeah. right after the deal, oil got going, Definitely. copper got going, stuff got Bags. going. Yeah, yeah. And um, unfortunately, the coronavirus uh, came along, and while the uh, stock market doesn't care, <laughs> right? And we we could talk forever about uh, coronavirus in the market, but um, commodities really got hit. Uh, particular areas, uh, copper, with and, and, and copper is so violent. Some of the moves, it was down twelve days in a row. Yeah, it just got smoked. Um, what what else? Uh, even coffee, something you wouldn't think. Like, what does that have to do? Well, China's closing all these stores. There's all these people not going, not drinking coffee, and plus there's a supply glut, which is a whole nother story. Yeah, and coffee has had an amazing decline since December, like down thirty percent. Wow. So, yeah. So so uh, what that 
does is it kind of scares you, right? Yeah. But the, well, I look at the other side. Well, this might be creating some tremendous opportunity because right. once again, let's let's just assume the world is not going to end and we're not going to have an outbreak situation like the movies right. and, or the Twelve Monkeys was one of my favorite uh, epidemic movies. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's just say that's not going to happen and things will be all right. Which is which was is what the stock market is telling us. Um, a lot of this stuff is going to bounce violently when China does come back online. Okay. So let's just uh, – who knows when that will take. A lot of people are saying once we get to this the spring, uh, I'll, this will help the situation over there. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I'm not a, not a doctor. I don't know anything. I know some about viruses because of the recent news. But, you know, logic says that when China comes back online, a lot of these commodities will bounce. So right. I'm looking at it as an opportunity at some of these, okay. um, these ones that have gotten uh, knocked down a lot, and that includes – um, you know, anything that has to do with the global growth story, such as, you know, copper and uh, uh, e- even like some like soybeans, because people are nervous about uh, maybe China will um, pull back on their phase one promises. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity going forward despite this. So how does an investor invest in a possible rebound in some of these things? Some of these commodities have their own ETF that's yeah. based on the con. On, on the commodity itself. Yeah. Some don't they like, do I want to buy, I don't know, iron ore companies that the mining companies, do I want to buy shipping companies who are going to be shipping the rebound of all the goods or like, how does an investor even get into investing in well, it? That's the, that's the real tricky part, right? So a lot of the underlying companies are going to have terrible quarters coming up. Right. So maybe we don't want to get into that until the smoke is clear, right? Okay. But the underlying futures contracts are the, the first responders, let's say, to any kind of positive momentum. So uh, you can go out and buy the futures contract of whatever underlying commodity you, you, you're desiring to get into, or you can buy the fu- the, uh, the ETF that follows that. So okay. what we're doing kind of in the service, we're not getting into the into the future contracts. I might talk about them when I show charts. I'm on my commentary, I'm going to obviously post charts on the futures contract more than the ETF because the futures contract trades uh, almost 24/7 and it's going to show a lot more price action than the ETF which, you know, obviously closes when the market closes. Right. So um but yeah, we're gonna. I'm gonna be putting uh, recommending ETFs such as like so for copper. Let's say we want to get into copper. There's an ETF called CPER as a ticker. What is it? CPER. CPER. Okay. <clears throat> There's another one too, but some of these ETFs have very very low volume. So when I mention um, the ETFs today, I'm going to be uh, putting out ones that have the most volume. I don't want to mess okay. around with the low volume ETFs, although they'd be be fine for longer term. I always as a trader, I'm always concerned concerned about liquidity. So uh, I don't want people paying uh, big spreads on any of these ETFs uh, if they're uh, what I call thin. So okay. um, I'm going to try to try to stick with uh, some of these ETFs that have more volume. Okay. Well, that was another question I had. Is this going to be geared more towards the short term, long term, or combination? Yeah. So when I had this idea, I didn't want to just uh, <clears throat> put it into uh, short ter- time frames or just a long time frames because commodities are very volatile. Yeah. So uh, I, I, the way I wanted to approach this is to have time frames across the board. So short, mid, long term. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the way I'm going to approach this is with short term, I want to attack with leverage ETFs. Okay. So we're going to enhance these short term games. And you know, obviously, if I see a move coming, it's I want to enhance it. So let's say I think gold's going to go up. There is a leverage gold ETF. There are actually a couple, but one I, one I like is <laughs> UGLD. Um, but you can also attack these with some and of what the, does that one do, UGLD? That is the, it's a, the times three uh, gold. So basically okay. 1% is 3% day gain. And if it's down 1%, you're going to lose 3%. And these and, are the ones that they even warn you you're only supposed to be in this for like a day. Yeah. So right? so like uh, for oil, it would be UWT and DWT. And there's others as well. Um, some are doubles, some are triples. Okay. Um, and I mean, there's there's a lot in the gold and energy space because people are really interested in those. Yeah. Uh, some of the other uh, commodities don't have that luxury of having those. But there's like there's silver, there's uh, uh, leverage silver. So there, okay. there, there's tons of areas to get into for those short gains. So okay. that's one aspect, and especially with that um, metals and energy space. There's a lot we can do in the short term. So for uh, the trading degenerates like me who want that <laughs> short term fix, we're gonna have that for you. Okay. For the 
for the people, for, let's let's go on to the, to the mid midterm. Basically, midterm, I had the idea we're going to target stocks. So the short term might be <laughs> one to three months, maybe even shorter than a month. The stocks are going to be three to six months, and uh, within that category of midterm, I will have some ETFs. Let's say I I say I see a copper move coming. Maybe I'm not holding a year. Maybe we get 10, 20 percent on that copper move in the next four months. I'm taking it, right? If okay. I if I see it's stalling now, you know, if I don't see any more potential, I'm going to take that. Now, let's say we also got into uh, Freeport McMoran, which is exposed to copper. Right. What's uh, that ticker? FCX. Uh, FCX. Yeah. That's right. Um, so we will, uh, you know, get into um, that copper stock. Basically, it's, a, it's what I'm considering in this, in this realm. Or, you know, if we wanted to get into oil stock, we'll get in and we're looking for those three to six month kind of uh, ranges, profits and within those uh, those three to six months. OK, so longer term, I'm looking for a kind of more macro moves. So uh, palladium is one that has just ripped over yeah. the last two to three years. It's been so hot. Yes. And so the, the ETF for that is P-A-L-L. The, the futures contract is P-A. So also, I'd like to add, if, if, if you have a thinkorswim platform or any trading platform and you want to look at some of these charts, uh, the way to do that is if you just take, uh, type in P-A, which is a futures contract for palladium, or C-L for crude oil, it's not going to work, right? You have to do a forward slash then C-L. And you can get the futures contract. So I know not a lot of people okay. are, are, are familiar with that. Yeah. But um, that's how you can kind of look at it is uh, do the slash first, then the underlying ticker. I don't want people getting lost. Like if they type in CL, they'll get Colgate, right? So right, that's right. not what we want. Um, so uh, for um, going back to the palladium, though. Yeah. Um, so it, why is it so hot? It's up 18% year to date. Right. And it's up what? like 200%. The year before that, I mean, yeah, it's it was. Huge. Let's see, I wrote this down here in 2016. We were at 500. We just got to 2400. Okay, uh, beginning of 2018, we were at 1K. So we've gone to 1,000 per ounce to 2400 uh, in 13 months. So that that's insane. And the reason well, behind that move, which I'll talk about in a okay. little bit, is is very interesting. But um, what is that doing? Because it's in a lot, some industrial items. Like, what is it doing to those items? Yeah, so it's very inflationary. Yeah, so palladium is a rare, rare me metal, right? Okay. So is pla so is a uh, platinum, and so uh, palladium is using catalytic converters, and there's been a lot of demand for it lately because of the emission controls. You know, you can actually call this kind of like a climate change trade, if you will. Okay. We have governments instituting these emission controls on cars. And there's new technology that uses the palladium that goes into these catalytic converters that um, helps these, uh, it basically turns the emissions into water vapor or carbon dioxide. And uh, it, it, it reduces all the emissions, all the bad emissions that pollute the planet, basically. Okay. So this is attractive to governments and they're instituting these, these controls and uh, the automakers are having to follow this and they're having to buy up this palladium because they need it for the catalytic converters. Yeah. Uh, not only that, there is a, a forced liquidation trade. People who take traders who take the opposite side of uh, the trade and go short are uh, running into trouble covering their positions. Uh, that be the reason being is, like I said, palladium is very, very rare. So if they are forced to uh, go out and deliver this metal, they are finding uh, issues with actually f going Finding outside it. the actual futures market <laughs> and actually delivering the actual palladium wow. to those who they owe it. So yeah. if you go short, just like you short a stock, you don't really, you you are bar basically selling somebody else's stock and you have to deliver that stock at a future date. Same thing with a futures contract. If you are shorting that, you have to deliver it if it's if you're out of the money. So uh, these traders are running into these issues and they either have to go find the metal or they have to blow out of their position. So we're seeing this parabolic rise. Um, and we, before this, we talked about Tesla. It's the kind of same thing that the market structure is basically that there is a shortage of stock and people are forced to buy it whether and this is caused by a short squeeze basically yeah um so that market will probably naturalize or just neutralize over time and yeah. come back down it might have some uh, where to go but that kind of move recognizing that move early on in 2017 2018 is what we're looking for in the longer term okay so i'm always going to have two or three etfs that are whether it be coffee lumber sugar corn wheat we're always going to have something in there that's going to be following like a multi-year trend that I see that we can pull out, uh, you know, double-digit gains on, or I see the possibility of that. Um, and on the risk side, uh, com commodities really uh, tell you you're wrong pretty quickly. Like 
they, they just show you're wrong. So we're going to be limiting our risk. Uh, like same thing in Counter Strike. If people are familiar, I try not to take any uh, losers over ten percent. Uh, I'm just okay. if I get there, I, I kind of know that my thesis of entering that was wrong because I do a lot of technical trading or looking at the charts. And it, usually my max risk is going to be about ten percent. And if it gets pat, like I'm buying these support levels basically, or buying a breakout. And if it gets down ten percent, I, I know I am essentially wrong. And in the commodity space, you do not want to fight uh, the movement of the, that price no. direction because 10 can turn into 20 and it can be 12 days in a row down like copper and all of a sudden yeah. you're down 40. If you're actually trading the futures contract rather than the um, the actual ETF, then you can get margin called out and, and that's just uh, – that's never fun. No. <laughs> okay. That's good to contain, contain losses. I like to yeah. hear that. Yes. What do you think is happening on the oil side? Because obviously coronavirus is throwing a wrench into that area too, but it's at like year lows or something now too. At least WTI, I'm not, I haven't looked at Brent lately, but Brent's got to be down there too. Yeah. And then you also have the added issue of OPEC messing around. They may or may not cut again, and so they can uh, create a floor in something in in the oil commodities. Is that an area that you're going to be looking at a lot in 2020, or what? Where do you stand on oil here? I think definitely. You know, starting the year, I really liked the energy space, um, just because the chart was actually shaping up kind of nicely. However, we had this wrench yeah. thrown at us, yeah. and uh, as I said, once you you realize you're wrong, you take those losses and move on to the next idea. And if you stuck with oil, you'd again just pretty destroyed, yeah. depending yeah. on how you approached it. Um, but yeah, so the whole OPEC thing was – they're losing some influence. They are. Just because there's such a supply glut that's coming from uh, the United States. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. we're becoming almost independent on our oil, oil. So that's holding yeah. back oil prices despite uh, – you, you know, even if there was a lot of global growth. So uh, that, that's an issue, and it's like a macro fundamental issue. And I'm not a oil fundamental expert. I look more like at the charts. Okay. Um, and this fifty dollar level that we're at is basically last year's lows. Right. Um, now this is also I talk about Fibonacci's a lot in Counter Strike. This is also a big uh, double test, I would call it, of those lows from last year, from previous lows the year before to recent highs this past year. So if this 61.8% level, Fibonacci level doesn't hold, we can continue on much, much lower. Yeah. And I, you know, I throw these price targets, like the, the target I would have is 28. I, it seems unrealistic, wow. but you'd be surprised how these fibs work sometimes. Yeah. And I can't, you know, it's like voodoo magic. I can't believe they work sometimes. So that would obviously be a big disaster for a lot of oil companies. But right. at the same time, what you're going to see with this, with this um, oil price pressure and crude is a lot of stocks that are holding up or a lot of oil energy stocks that are mm -hmm. holding up. And you're going to be like, why isn't this going down? It should be going down. And all these other, you know, nine out of 10 are going down. And this one's holding up. That's how you can find some of these winners. If they're showing technical support, if they're earnings, if they're managing the situation where they're just holding up, that's how we're going to find winners. And, you know, they, they'll they go into earnings and they'll shock everybody. We're still making money. Our management's killing it. Blah, 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 this and that. We're, yeah. we're okay. Maybe they're hedging appropriately. Right. Um, so there will be opportunity within this. Um, I don't know if there – there's definitely blood in the water. Yeah. I don't know if the sharks are here yet. Okay. So I my instinct tells me we will get go lower because there's so many things going against this. Yeah. But I'm going to keep my eyes open for potential winners like how I describe uh, stocks that are holding up. So I kind of want to approach this from the stock point of view. Okay. Because there's so many stocks and so many to choose from that we are going to find winners within the oil space. You just got to – you just got to look closely. Okay. Well, good luck on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've been in and out of the oil stocks. They're in, tough. Yeah. You know, another thing I should bring up, and this is getting a little off topic of the commodity space, but uh, a lot of these still play or pay nice dividends. Yeah. So we're going to find some dividend support, especially with that whole macro thing going on with interest rates going lower. So. If they can manage to hold their dividends higher, you will find some price support there. Uh, it's just a question is, uh, if the revenue stop coming, do they cut their dividends? Right. And watch out for those dividends that are too high because right. that's often there's some a red sign. flag. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, 
What about on the ag side? What's yeah. going on over there? Because everybody was super concerned about the farmers. We've got the trade war going on, but we mm-hmm. had the phase one agreement, which you mentioned earlier. And supposedly, oh, the farmers are going to be fine now. But a lot of those commodities are still seemingly, you know, not at a great level either. Yeah. Well, the I, corn and the soybeans and all that. Yeah, I would call it them boring right now. Okay. Like there, there's just uh, the planting season's coming up. Right. And that's when things start to pick up, right? Okay. And that's when I go, you know, when I go on my summer vacations and I'm <laughs> like, I'm talking about the corn. And do you the, go and go into the cornfield like no, some people no, no, no. do? No, I'm not going. I'm they just, go and they stand out no, there no, no. and then they're like, it should be up to my shoulders right now, and it's only up to my chest. Listen, I, it's behind. <laughs> this happens. I don't think that's going to give me an edge over okay. me just seeing from the car how high it is. <laughs> <laughs> so they can do that. I'm just going to – if I did that, my wife would kill me. I'm not okay. getting out of the car. All right. I'm just going to comment, oh, you know, knee high by the 4th of July. That's what my dad used to all say. It's <laughs> right. looking a little low, or it's <laughs> looking pretty good. So I'm going to short. You know, it looks like the crop's good. Yeah. And, you know, I, her family is in Nebraska, so we get to go through okay. Illinois. Right. Iowa, which is the biggest this corn is the producer. Bread basket. Yeah, we get to yeah. see we get to see it all. So um, that's always fun is checking out the corn rep. Now, what does that have to do with uh, or the price? Well, um, we have these uh, supply and demand reports that come out, and actually, WASD uh, came out this morning. Right when I was walking out the door, okay, uh, it came out, and I I got to see it. Looked like inventories are right at levels they were supposed to be. Okay, uh, which I think su- soybeans came in a little low, but um, that's the kind of stuff I'm gonna be lo- looking at and talking about. Uh, stuff that nobody pays attention to unless you do have money at stake within these in these segments within right. within the ags. Um, but those like just looking into those numbers and watching the price action, we we are able to kind of formulate some long term trends sometimes. And you know, the spring and summertime sometimes have the greatest moves because of the weather, right? We mm-hmm. got the floods, we got a long winter, yeah. we got a drought. You know, there's all these different elements can mess with the crop um, or create. Uh, violent price swings uh, in anticipation of a uh, you know low crop coming out or uh, oversupply and whatnot. So um, there is definitely an it is, spring and summer will be definitely an exciting time to be watching these things. Is there any thought? This is just reminding me of it now that we're talking about the agriculture side of. Um, playing like avocado prices, like those spiked last year. Now they've come way down. There is a way to play. I think there's a couple companies that actually grow avocados what? that you can buy the stock, and well, that well, was the, gone crazy. The big one would be Chipotle, right? They're the biggest well, avocado buyer. Yeah. So if prices were to spike, that would could hit their bottom. It did bottom when it line. spiked last year, right? Uh, so it's not really a direct like. It's hard to find those direct plays, right? With, and there's no uh, there's no ETF for avocados. So okay, we, we can't, that was my question. I thought <laughs> no, no, maybe no, there we, might be one. We now. can't. But yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> when you dig deeper into like the underlying stocks and how these commodities uh, affect prices, something like Tyson Chicken or Pilgrim's Pride had, were affected greatly by situations in China. Yeah. So um, is that the pork issue? Yeah. So okay. so chicken as a substitute. Uh, okay. Help them out tremendously. So, but yeah, they uh, they also involved in pork as well. Um, so yeah, th- that kind of uh, that kind of, that kind of news just it, you'd be surprised how much they can move uh, stocks as well. So we're going to be looking at all that stuff. Any stock that has anything to do with underlying commodity, if there's news in there, we're going to be trying to get in and take advantage of any kind of big moves like that. Okay. What else do we need to know? Are those the main areas that I've covered? Um, what about energy metals? Uh, we didn't talk much about. Food. We talked a little bit of coffee. Cocoa yeah. has okay. had a bump this year, which you know I was yeah, talking the, about stocks. Wasn't uh, that at record highs too? Yeah, for it, a while that's been moving around too. So Hershey okay. is Hershey is directly right. Correlated. So big time. Yeah. So there's another example of how not, well, something we can get into if we do see a pr- big price swing. Um, lumber. Uh, we're seeing record home new home construction. So uh, the, the price of lumber is starting to trickle up. That went crazy. Coincidentally, at the same time I was building my my cedar deck, lumber prices were hitting high. So wow. I had to pay pay through the roof. What's going to uh, happen, do you think? They just put on extended tariffs onto nails that are imported in, which I guess most steel nails are imported in, or aluminum, I guess, a steel. I guess they're steel. Um, and that was another 25%. What That could have an issue, too, 
I don't know if you are be trading. Do you trade those kinds of things? Well, that those are so steel and aluminum are there's stocks that are underlying, but there, okay. there's not a lot of ETFs that are directly correlated because there's not that futures contract within, uh, you know, that you can trade. Okay. The, so a lot of that stuff's traded in China, like iron ore, yeah. and steel. So, um, but Alcoa, U.S. Okay. Steel. Um, okay. there, there, there's a lot of steel uh, and aluminum companies out there that we can target if we do see price fluctuation lately, no matter what the tariffs have done, the stock prices have been going down. And right. It's just like US, US steel, steel has been a disaster. Yeah. Right. Now, will there be a turnaround there? I'm, I'm going to be watching. Yeah. But, uh, for now, it's an avoid. Okay. Um, because those, those estimates are just being slashed yeah. all the heck. They have all kinds of issues there. Um, yeah. But uh, that's ticker X, by the way. Yeah, USD. ticker X, and uh, Alcoa is AA. Um, so yeah, those. You are don't def- hear many people mention Alcoa anymore mm-hmm. since they yeah. got busted up. Yeah, you know, it, it was interesting. I was, they had earnings, uh, you know, a month ago, I think, or three weeks ago, and I typed up this, the stock after uh, after I heard uh, their their numbers come out, and I was like, whoa, this one got low. And it just hasn't been on okay. My, I haven't even looked at it. I know it hasn't been on my radar. I'm like this thing really fell apart. Okay. So uh, so yeah, it's not a space. You know, I'm, I'm not interested in getting in that space unless it uh, has some potential. Right now, they just don't. So uh, okay. we have plenty of other areas to put our money. So okay. we're, we'll focus on that. Now you did mention to me that you might be taking a look at currencies in this too. Yeah. Is what's going on there? Yes. I don't I don't even go anywhere near currencies just to yeah, say. Yeah, so we'll see <laughs> you know, we'll see some big macro swings in currencies from time to time. Yeah. Right? Um this isn't gonna be the focus of the newsletter. Okay. But we, we do have the opportunity if something comes to us. So okay. a situation like the Brexit obviously moved right. the British pound a lot. Um and if the if the Fed were to change their policy on lowering interest rates, there would be a fundamental shift that could move other currencies. So okay. that's something that we're going to uh, keep an eye on. And if there's big currency moves, that'll be in the content I'll provide. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and the idea is to, to to make money. So if I see something in the currency world, we'll get in. Okay. Now, every time I talk about commodities with anybody, I have to bring up, you know, the Trading Spaces movie <laughs> or Trading Places movie. Yeah. And that was Orange Futures, right? Yeah, is is that still a thing? Can you still Orange Juice Futures? Can you yeah, do that? For okay. Sure. They are very popular. There's no, there used to be ETF for them and their volume wasn't there. Okay. So, um, so yeah, but there's all kinds of different futures you'd be surprised. I mean, there's butter and milk, you know, there's all kinds okay. of stuff. And, you know, the the guys who, who, you know, there's not that many of them anymore, but the guys who were down at the SIBO wearing the funny jackets, uh, you know, yeah. they, they were in that. That was their thing. I remember uh, at, a, at a happy hour talking to some guy and he, he traded butter futures. Wow. Like, butter futures. What the heck is yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> like, then this is years ago before yeah. I was even uh, exposed to the commodity space. And uh, that was a fun conversation. Opened my eyes a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, this sounds really interesting. I'll be intrigued to see what you get into and where you find the opportunities because it does seem like commodities are kind of like a hidden area here in 2020. Yep. And especially with this, with the coronavirus, like a lot of things, there could be opportunities, as we said. Yeah, volatility creates opportunity. And yeah. that's where we're kind of in in the commodity world right now. So, uh, we're looking for that second half, the opportunity yeah. to kick in here shortly, and uh, that's what we're we'll looking for. Okay, cool. I'm going to have you back on in like the middle of the year, and we can talk about where some of this stuff has gone Great. and where you did find opportunity. Okay, so just a reminder, if you want to just check out the Commodity Innovators, you can go to zax.com slash promo. It's easy to remember, zax.com slash promo. And even if you see some other kind of ad when you go to the hat, like for some other service or something, you can do a 30-day trial on that link always for a dollar, and you will get the Commodity Innovators in in among all of the newsletters here at Zach. So you will be able to check it out um, along with everything else, no matter what promo is on there when you click on that link. So go to zax.com slash promo. And let's recap some of the tickers we talked about. So the one of the gold um, uh, leveraged gold he mentioned was UGLD. We had the copper, CPER, 
Um, he mentioned the oil is UWTI. That's easy to remember these ones. They're so good with their ETF tickers, well, aren't they? It, it's UWT now. Oh, UW. Yeah. What is it? UWT? Yeah. They, they, they actually used They got to, rid of the I? They did. Oh. They got rid of the I. Well, I was and, giving them credit for being clever. and. Yeah. So uh, it, it's weird. The, the way the ETN was structured, they had to make adjustments and roll over and while they were doing that, they just got rid of the I. And the, the short one is DWTI, or was DWTI, now it's DWT. So, yeah, there's uh, there, there's some other okay. OILU is, does the same thing. Okay. Uh, so, you know, if you look hard enough, you can find, you find plenty all of these. these. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I would just key in, like, with these, just check the volume. Make sure, okay. like, go with the one that has the highest volume when you're messing with these. Okay. And do you care at all about expense ratio? You don't if you're just doing it short term. Right. Uh, n- no. I mean, okay. easy answer is think. no. Right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, volume is more important than expense yeah. ratio. Okay. And um, we talked about a couple of companies. Freeport, McMoran is FCX. Uh, U.S. Steel is just X. Alcoa is AA. We did mention Chipotle with that avocado play. CMG. And um, what? Oh, Paul is the Palladium P A L L. That was an important one. Yeah. And I think that's most of the tickers we covered. So if you want to know more, if you want to get whatever else he's going to be in, I don't even know what's going to go in there. Um, again, go to slash promo. And every week, I will be bringing you more stocks here on the Market Edge. And covering all the categories of things that are happening in the stock market. So you don't want to miss a single episode. Be sure to subscribe here to get all of our podcasts. We are on SoundCloud, of course, and you can get us on Apple Podcasts. And we're now on Spotify. But be sure to get us somewhere, wherever you can subscribe. And I'll see you again next week with some more stocks. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.